Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 270 of the Grid Talk podcast. Today, we are here to discuss qualifying for the 2023 Australian Grand Prix. My name is Louis Edwards, and joining to me, joining me today, we have Grid Talk co-host Owen Medford. Hello. And from the Five Red Lights, we have Aaron Harper. Good morning. But as always, before we get to this episode, we must thank our sponsor, and that is Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your college basketball betting this season. Get analysis of every play, prop, and point at Bet Online. You'll be able to find the latest odds, bracket contests, team matchups, and game trends at Bet Online. Updated odds for everything from live games, the conference championship, right through to the final four and the championship games. Bet Online is your college basketball headquarters this season. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to sign up and receive 50% welcome bonus on your very first deposit. Be sure to use our promo code BLEAV, that's B-L-E-A-V, um, to receive your bonus. BetOnline.ag, where the game starts. So, Owain, we'll start with, I think the man that a lot of people tip for pole, but it wasn't easy for Verstappen or Red Bull uh, this, you know, well, today, it's generally this weekend, but he still managed to do it, set on pole, which I think most people are going to expect him to convert that into a win. Yeah, it's been a bit of a nightmare, really. Um, obviously, the other side of the garage hasn't had a rubber the green, but, you know, Red Bull's been struggling all weekend. Um, I know in FP1 and FP2, uh, Verstappen had quite big uh oversteer issues and those were sort of continuing into qualifying uh obviously i'm, I'm not a psychopath i didn't get up at 2 15 a.m or whatever it is uh to, to see uh fp3 but um yeah no he uh he was he was struggling all the way through qualifying as well i think it was um whether he was just sort of like slightly out of sync with the track evolution or whatever or um or that was for, uh red bull sort of keeping their cars close to their chest or or just you know saving back tires because to be honest they've got the speed to go through um even when they're having a bit of a duff week uh in, on, on the saturday but um no it was just you know he, he did what the, the very best drivers can do which is um come out you know work out what to do over the first two qualifying sessions and uh and put it all together on that that, that last lap um yeah it was probably uh, as a uh, as a result of uh doing the double the double warm up lap on the on the slow laps rather than going straight for a fast lap. Um, they have been struggling with uh, tire warm up, but yeah, he just pulled out half a second um, on the rest of them, uh, and and you know only George Russell could get near at that point. Yeah, it was certainly unlikely candidates. Aaron, who um, looked to challenge the Red Bull this weekend, and it feels like we've gone back in time a few years because we've got a Red Bull on pole, but then we've got the two Mercedes of George Russell and then Lewis Hamilton right behind him. How much of a challenge do you expect Mercedes to give Red Bull tomorrow? In a straightforward race, Verstappen's going to disappear and be 30 seconds up the road halfway through the race, and the the, the battle for the win is going to be very much down to if Verstappen hangs on to the lead at turn one and how quickly he then regains that lead if he does lose it. But I don't expect that. I I don't see Mercedes having the race pace to challenge. Their fight is behind them. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned George Russell. He's the only driver who got into the 116s along with Max Verstappen. And so today was really, really interesting. I've just been looking at the, the progression times uh, for Mercedes, Aston Martin and Ferrari. So they all found time, obviously, of course, through the session track evolution. But Mercedes, both drivers found almost half a second. And in Russell's case, just over, I think, just a bit of quick maths. Um, That's a huge improvement from one session to another when there's less cars on the track. But I think this is a similar trait that we saw last year. The Mercedes tends to use its tyres a little bit more kindly. So the Ferrari maybe gets heat into its tyres really well, but the Mercedes was able to produce lap times, lap after lap after lap, which is why they have such good race pace compared to their qualifying performance. Starting second and third on the grid with arguably, maybe outside of Alonso, the best race pace of that group behind Red Bull, that puts them in a really strong position to score at least one podium tomorrow. And it's it's so interesting, this storyline of Russell keeping 
a, 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 like a, he's now three and zero against Hamilton this season, and we, we we've seen Hamilton uh, speaking about how he's uncomfortable in the car and the seat position. It just doesn't feel quite the same to him. He's too far forward essentially, so he doesn't have that connection to the rear. And we have to understand that these drivers are super finely tuned and they they feel the car. They're so much more sensitive, and the best drivers are perhaps even more sensitive to it. And we saw that with, with Vettel how. His, his performance is fluctuated depending on the car's traits. But take nothing away from George. It's a superb run of form he's got in qualifying. He's not missed a Saturday for no reason. And he's really showing that against the king of qualifying in Formula One history now, which just shows you how good George Russell is. Yeah, it was a mighty job um, by George Russell. And he you know, even was, I think, was a tad surprised with the with just how quickly he was saying, he, he was saying he, he thought he was only a, he was a whole second off, but no, just two and a half tenths. Um, it's certainly a lot faster than I think a lot of us expected. So away and behind the two Mercedes, we do have the usual suspect of Fernando Alonso. Um, I don't think he can really be too disappointed because you know he has a good chance against Mercedes. We've seen that that um, the Aston Martin has good race pace, but they do seem a bit draggy, especially in that second sector. Do you think that could play a big role in maybe preventing Alonso getting on the podium tomorrow? Well, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things of uh, once you're in a race, it's obviously different to qualifying speed. Um, you know, it, it's something we see in all forms of motorsport, but, um, you know, you, you you tend to see as much as you know the, the cars are getting their lap time at different places uh obviously fernando alonso is relatively close to the mercedes just um 0.035 seconds uh off of lewis hamilton in q3 uh, but it's where on the track that come that lap time comes if it's in a straight line um for the mercedes that that they're getting it uh compared to uh compared to the aston martin it could be quite difficult to overtake um as Aaron mentioned, the Mercedes do tend to have quite good race pace just as a result of the of their tire use. Um, so Alonso, as much as he is Fernando Alonso, and he's one of those people that you know I wouldn't put it past him to to get past all three cars at the start uh, in front of him. Um, you know, there, there there is obviously a little bit. There might be a little bit uh, of difficulty uh, getting that delta you need um, on lap time. A, a track that's not particularly easy to overtake at. Uh, it, it it must be said. Um, so, you know, I think he might struggle if he doesn't sort of clear a, a car or two, uh, very, very quickly. I think he might struggle to get on the podium, um, just because he, he just won't have, he just won't have the, uh, sort of the, the, the cornering ability, um, to overcome the straight line, def- uh, the straight line deficit that they seem to have. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say this is a trend for the season. I'd point, like to point out, it's just uh, it's just a case of uh, Australia is a slightly different track to everywhere else. So, um, yeah, it could be a struggle, but I definitely think he's in with a chance. Yeah, you can definitely never count out Alonso, but as you, as Wayne said, it uh, Albert Park, despite the changes that they've made to the layout, is still a difficult track to overtake, and uh, it could be a, a difficult one. And Aaron P5 for um, Carlos Sainz. It, it's difficult to say uh, what to say about Ferrari. They are just kind of existing within the sort of the top half of the field. They don't really look like they're looking for wins. And given where well, both um, uh, Ferraris are, it looks like a podium may even be quite difficult this weekend. If I remember to unmute myself, you'll be able to hear my answer. <laughs> um, it tells you a lot about the situation at Ferrari that's just hanging over them from last year. That they're both half a second off the fastest time. And they, they've been beaten in every round by Aston Martin. And well, maybe except Bahrain, I think. Was it Leclerc was uh, third on the grid in Bahrain, if I remember correctly. I think so. Um but yeah, it's, it's it's just that same pattern with Ferrari. They can't seem to get it right. And you you think they'd be on top of it. They had a positive day by Charles Leclerc's account yesterday. And then they find themselves fifth and seventh on the grid. And for, for Carlos Sainz, that's, you know, it's another feather in his cap because he's got himself ahead of Leclerc. He beat Leclerc in Jeddah, obviously reached the chequered flag in Bahrain. 
So if the car does come good by some minor miracle, then perhaps he becomes the one they rally around. But the car just seems to be so hit and miss. Sometimes it looks good. Sometimes it's less good. There were times where they were setting purple sector times. Then Verstappen, of course, would turn up and, and blow that out of the water. But it's just a very odd situation with Ferrari. And there's so many rumours around team personnel leaving. And I think they're still trying to understand this car. They, they've they made some changes to it and it, it doesn't seem to have, have worked in the way they'd hoped. So it, it's it's a long it's a long way back now for Ferrari because Aston Martin are getting in, in there. Alpine are not far away. You've got McLaren who are looking to bring up grades. So Ferrari's position in that sort of second group behind Red Bull is potentially under threat from several teams coming from the midfield. And it it's worrying. Mercedes aren't in a great position because of their recent history. But I'd rather be in a Mercedes seat right now than I would in a Ferrari, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Ferrari has uh, definitely been a, a poison chalice for some uh, for some time now, and uh, it looks like it's uh, ensnared a couple more victims. But away, uh, we'll move on to P six uh, quickly with um, with a uh, Lance Stroll, and there's again kind of similar to. Um, the Ferraris in the case Stroll, you know, he's in the competitive car, but of course he is being uh, overshadowed by his teammate, not only just because of just pure pace, but we also know what's going on with, uh, with Lance Stroll at the moment and the reasons why he may not be able to be driving to his full potential. But P6 is still a respectable effort, you know, ahead of one of the Ferraris solidly within that top 10 and points look pretty, you know, pretty solid for, the Lance Stroll tomorrow. Yeah, um, I'd call it a net P7 to be honest uh, from Lance Stroll. Really, you, you have to assume that had uh, had Perez not made that mistake, obviously he did. Uh, that Perez would be would be above him, but um, you know Stroll, decent job. Um, the recovery time on his injury, uh, I still, I, I obviously I'm not a doctor. I have no idea what how long that's going to be, but it, it's a fairly decent amount of time for those injuries. Um, and it's also worth noting, obviously, that uh, as much as yeah, it's been sort of what, over a month now since it happened, but he's still uh, he's still in a uh, uh, he's still in a Formula One car. Um, you know, th- there's putting sort of extreme forces on the body that may be affecting that. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things. Of it's it's, it's a decent enough performance, um, but. Uh, yeah, so it's a decent enough performance, um, but you know it's 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 where he should be. Um, obviously, you know he needs to get closer to his teammate. Um, he, he, uh, you know what I say that he's, I say he needs to get closer to his teammate. He's under two tenths off. Um, you know that's probably just on the edge of 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 you know uh, sort of on the on the edge of what's acceptable. Um, but yeah, it's uh. The, I mean, the one thing to note is that his Q two time, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Alonso's Q two time was fa- was faster than uh, Stroll's Q three time. So there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of way to go. Um, but I don't know how much you can attribute that to to just a raw talent. Um, you know, I think unfortunately he is being compared against one of the all time greats. I, I have no, uh, I have no reservations about saying that so uh, i think you know you take that into account it's actually quite a decent performance yeah we uh, i think we all have to sort of uh applaud uh lance Stroll for what he's been able to do given uh given the circumstances this season and uh p6 is yet another sort of consistent qualifying which we're not always used to seeing from lance Stroll. he's uh he's often incredibly um a bit off it uh, on Saturday. He comes back into the weekend on a Sunday, but he's been doing good jobs in qualifying um, thus far. Uh, so, Aaron, we move on to the other uh, Ferrari of uh, Charles Leclerc, and now being out qualified twice, you know, it must be such a kick in the teeth for Leclerc. Just like with three races in, but his season is getting off to such a bad start, and it 
doesn't look like any sign of improving just yet. I said in my predictions episode on my channel yesterday, Charles Leclerc needs a break. He just needs something to go his way. I've actually predicted him for a podium. Um, I'm now looking rather foolish. But the thing is, I, I, I believe that Charles Leclerc is the fastest single lap qualifier in the field. And I think he showed that last year. He obviously had a car to do it. And that that does play a big factor in it. You look at Verstappen. I, I wouldn't say Verstappen is the outright fastest on a single lap, but he's got the best combination of car and driver. So he's able to go and produce the lap time. Leclerc is clearly struggling to get the most out of this Ferrari on a consistent basis. He did actually qualify second in Jeddah. But when, I'd, I wonder if they, they turned the wick up on that Ferrari power unit to make sure they limited the damage for Sunday. Not that it really transpired in any great fruit because he ended up seventh in the race and behind his teammate. And that's where he starts tomorrow. So it's going to be a difficult afternoon for Charles. And the Ferrari hasn't shown itself to be that good in race pace. I would be concerned if I was Leclerc about the start and maybe getting stuck behind the Williams. If Albon gets the jump on Leclerc, and we've seen how quick the Williams is in a straight line, it could be a difficult afternoon for Charles Leclerc tomorrow. He's going to need some rain, some safety cars, just some general chaos to get him back up the order and uh, make me look a little bit more sensible by predicting him for a podium. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's going to be difficult. I can't see Ferrari actually getting on the podium from that position. They've got four cars ahead of them that are stronger on race pace. They've got a Williams and the Alpine pair behind them that are pretty quick in a straight line. So it could be a bit of a messy afternoon tomorrow for for or tomorrow morning for, um, for Ferrari. Yeah, it certainly could be. And as you've rightly mentioned, there is a, a possibly a nagging Williams behind Owen. And if I could award a driver of the day on a Saturday after quali- qualifying, I would give it to Alex Albon for an amazing job that he's done. He scored points here last year. He did an amazing uh, one-stop strategy. And here he is in P8 with a quite a seemingly very, very good chance of points. Yeah, he seems reinvigorated. Um, I think the track helps. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm slightly surprised. Um, we obviously saw the Williams be first in a straight line. I think it might have been at Canada last year. Um, a number of other places. And we were sort of surprised because we were like, Where, where's the speed come from? You know, it just seems that, that when you when you wind the downforce off a bit, which is a bit odd considering Albert Park, but when you wind the downforce off a bit, it kind of it comes to them a bit and it's a bit more aerodynamically efficient. And it's, as you say, in the, in the second sector, it was nigh unbeatable. Um, you know, well, in fact, it was unbeatable. He, he came away with the fastest middle sector. Um, you know, with, with we, we were singing the, the Red Bull's praises and we have been for how quick it is in a straight line, which has obviously been Red Bull's strong, um, as, uh, sorry, Achilles heel in recent years. Obviously that's changed. And then there we go. We've got, you know, we've got the Williams, like they were they were quick in a straight line last year, causing problems for people. And they're quick in a straight line this year, it seems at times. And you know, he's he, he's 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 used that to great effect. Um, you know, and he's put himself to get you know against uh, a load of cars that, or above a load of cars that you would say are faster than the Williams that, um, or at least should be. Um, so it, you know, it's obviously it's a great result. And as you say, like you get a decent start for Albon, a collision up front. Uh, you know, and and he could be sitting in fifth place by the end of the first or second lap. Um, you know, and 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 also as you say, like you know, I couldn't have said it better myself. That is a Williams that because it's a straight pass and straight line, and we said about where the lap time speed comes from. He could be sitting there for for long periods of time, just causing issues for for the cars behind. Um, you know, and really sort of holding them up. Um, you know, I, I it. it I, can, I just guess it just goes to show, like tra- Tram position is going to be is going to be king, um, and he's done a great performance to get himself some, um, and, and sort of stay out that throng behind. So Albon training coming tomorrow, then it would seem. Um, but you know, it's uh, as I said earlier, I think it was an absolutely remarkable. Um, 
drive by Albon today, and he got himself in front of the Alpine of Pierre Gasly. Um, Aaron, he's um, he's doing a solid job in that Alpine. Is um, is Gasly? He's um, ahead of Ocon, which obviously is the most important thing, and also in the points and in such an incredibly tight midfield. And given some of the issues that Alpine have had already, it's a, you know you can't knock it. Is a is a good qualifying position to be in. Yeah, Gasly's done a decent job there. They were saying in commentary he'd never, uh, he'd, he'd only once been in Q two, and now he's in the Alpine and gets himself into Q three. I think he well, he probably would have been all right if Ocon had got a clean lap in. Um, but I think there's definitely more to come from the Haas, considering that Hulkenberg is P ten. And Magnussen's down in 14th. So Gasly's done a, a decent job there. That's the job he's basically there to do. The, the frustrating thing for Alpine will be that Williams of Alex Albon in the way, and as we've just mentioned, could be potentially extremely difficult to overtake considering its speed down the straights. But Gasly's a, a good operator in a race. He does sometimes get tangled up in, in first lap incidents. I think that that's something that can happen to any driver, but especially when they're in the midfield. But it's a decent position to start from. Alpine look like the best of the rest outside of Mercedes, Ferrari, and Aston. So you know, that, that's only going to leave you know maybe ninth, eighth on the table. So you've got to, if you're Alpine, you've got to be scooping those points up because at some point. There's going to be something happen up front, and you need to be on hand to collect those much bigger points. And if they're they're not putting themselves in positions to do that, then you have to wonder what they're doing organizationally. Fortunately for them, they're doing all the things correctly. They've got one car in ninth, one car in eleventh. So for Gasly, it's good for him because he's out qualified Ocon, and there's that little personal battle going on. So he'll be very pleased with that, and it gives him a good strong start position for tomorrow. Yeah, you're very right to mention, Aaron, just uh, about first lap collisions. We've seen some mighty first lap collisions in Australia. And given how how much narrower and how much tighter turn one is, it's, um, it could potentially uh, catch a, a few drivers out um, tomorrow because you know, these cars are big, they're clunky. And some of the drivers on the grid, um, not naming names, don't always know how to uh, race side by side. Um so away, oh, we'll move on to the uh, the two Haas drivers now. So Nico Hulkenberg in tenth place, rounding up the top ten, and then Kevin Magnussen in fourteenth. I mean Hulkenberg again, having very solid qualifying, but more often than not, aren't really translating into great race results. Um, and given that he has the likes of Esteban Ocon right behind him, do you reckon that Haas will be able to score points? I mean, they've got every hope. I mean, they've put themselves in probably the the best possible position that you you could have expected them to get without a rain affected qualifying. Um, I don't know quite how how Hulkenberg managed it. To be honest, he's you know he's put himself in a, an unseasonably high position. You'd expect him to be below, you know, sitting around the fifteenth, sixteenth place, but here he is in tenth, um, and he's got to be commended for that. Um, you know, so that's a really good performance. The question is, as you say, whether they stay there. Unfortunately, I don't know what the long run pace was like for the Haas. Um, but based on sort of, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> coming in clutch there where Aaron is saying that uh, Hulkenberg's got Q3 in every race. So maybe it's just Hulkenberg being amazing. Um, just just, just seasonal form. It's not a seasonal form, but like, it's just, just perennial form. That's what I mean. Um you know, obviously, it's the reason that they got him in. Uh, that other teams got him in in the first uh, for for other race weekends when he had to sub in, and uh, and that's why House have probably got him now. Um, the real question is, yeah, can they stay there? Um, can he make? Can he pick up points um, without something else, something crazy happening? Um, I think obviously Hulkenberg's consistent enough to be able to do that. The question is the speed um, over the long runs. Like I say, I don't know the long run pace. Um, I can see it happening. I don't quite remember the race results for other uh, for the other races. Um, but you know, Hulkenberg's a decent racer. He can place the car where he needs to, and he knows. And honestly, you know, he's experienced enough that he he's he's been around Albert Park a fair few times, probably probably over 600 times now just just did laps alone uh, in races so he'll know where to put the car he'll know where to where where he can you know eke out the tires and things like that um i think there's 
you know, I, I'd go out on a on a on a limb and say, yeah, that's probably that that that's a that's a, a decent chance of points for for the Hass uh, from Hulkenberg. Um, uh, yeah, it's a it, it's a really decent result, and obviously it sets them up very well very well for tomorrow. It certainly does, but uh, it'll be keeping the no- noses clean will be a uh, key for the Hass tomorrow. Um, we only could kind of already touched on um, Alpine and Esteban Ocon. Um, Aaron, with what you were saying about Gasly, you know, um, Alpine do look like they have a good car, but, you know, it's going to be all about getting ahead of that um, that Williams ahead and getting past those cars and making sure they uh, they score good points. So we'll move on to the Alpha Tauris. Um, Yuki Snowder in P12 and Nick DeFries in um, P 15 you know we were chatting just um just before the podcast um saying that the fridge still yet to really get comfortable with that car and i think that's why we're not seeing as good as performances maybe as we were expecting uh from Nick the freeze um so far this season yeah and i think they, they, that, that that point is twofold because of course you've got devries who's come over from formula e had one uh, outing in Formula One at Monza last year in a Williams that was very specific. And we're seeing that this weekend, um, strong in a straight line. So it allowed him to, to be really competitive. The Alpha Tauri is very different. It's not as good as people want it, what people would like it to be. Um, so in that sense, Sonoda has a bit more, obviously has more experience. And that that's showing at the moment because he kind of, sh- he's showing in qualifying and in races that, he understands the car. I think he's finished 11th every race so far this, this season. I say every race, both races. <laughs> I've only had two of 23 races, which is absolutely bonkers. Um, but 12th for Yuki Sonoda, that is impressive because I'll be honest, I'm not convinced by Sonoda. When I saw his spin in the practice highlights uh, yesterday, where he goes flying over the gravel at turn one, I just thought, well, that's classic Sonoda, isn't it? He's pushing too hard and you know, he's, he's let the car get away from him. That being said, he's scooped it all up. He's kept it out of the barriers in practice. He's kept it pointing the right way in, in qualifying and delivered a really good result. He's ahead of Lando Norris, a very highly rated driver. He's ahead of Kevin Magnussen, who we know is quick over one lap. And he's beaten his teammate. He's beaten Piastri. And he's beaten the likes of both Alfa Romeos and obviously the other Williams as well. So that is a good group of drivers that Alfa Tauri want to be competing with regularly and want to be beating. And that is the job that Yuki Snowden needs to do until that car becomes a more competitive machine to show, yes, I have the consistency. Uh, We know he has the speed, but he's got to have that temperament as well. He's got to transform that into the race. And if he can continue being consistent, okay, he's not getting any points for it at the moment, but the pattern is there. The team will see the job that he's doing and it will keep him at the team what his long-term future looks like is a mystery because apparently what's the long-term future of that team now that Dietrich Mashashitz has passed away. So he's doing everything he can at the moment. And this is just another step in improving that he is Formula One worthy. And there were a lot of question marks over him this season because he's he's not delivered in the way people have hoped. But this is a, a really positive and a positive surprise for me, I'm, I'm really pleased for Snowden in, in that respect. Yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a tough, well, very tough uh, first couple of years for, um, for Yuki Sonoda in Formula One. And if this is a sign of better things to come, then I think a lot of us are all for it. Um, but he's got to continue to uh, to show just how good he is because. There are so many Red Bull drivers in F2 this season that could uh, that could easily take his spot. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely got to keep uh, one eye in uh, the rearview mirror. Um, away and we'll move then on to McLaren and um, yet another disappointing uh, qualifying session. Uh, Lando Norris, P13. I think that was the best that they were ever going to get out of that car. And um, Oscar Piastri, it is your first home qualifying. Um, just missed out and will start P16 uh, tomorrow. I think all we can really hope for, as, as personally as a McLaren fan, is that they just make it through turn 
turn one or lap one just cleanly and have a normal race. Yeah, I think it says a lot that uh, their best performance, I think, in qualifying is uh, is a disappointing one, um, particularly you know where that where they are. You know, obviously not uh, Norris. You know, Norris uh, obviously got into thirteenth, which is is one of their better performances, um, but. You know, he had to go through the gravel to get there, mildly avoiding uh, doing a Perez himself. Um, you know, and obviously got himself into thirteenth, which is a decent enough position. Um, but like you say, it's right in the it's right in the the area where it could be an issue to get to turn one unscathed. Um, and bear in mind that they've lost front wings all over the shop this season, um, and 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 you know had to, had to retire from from uh, the other races. Uh, yeah, it's it's, it's not. You know, it doesn't bode well. Um, and then you've got Piastri, and that's, uh, you know, I feel, I feel for Piastri. No one wants to come to their home race. Uh, you know, they're, they're actually, the, well, it was a, I think it's their fir- his first race around Albert Park as well. Um, obviously, you know, coming through F2 and F3 where they haven't been to, where uh, they haven't been to Albert Park before. Um, and uh, and he's and he's knocked out, uh, out of Q1. Um by one of the slimmest of margins, honestly. Um, you know, it's you know, it's, I think it was knocked out by Sonoda. Um, you know, for something ridiculous, like it's you know, it's a, it's a tiny amount. It's, it's under point. Uh, it's, it's like four tenths or something ridiculous. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, he'll be kicking himself because I, I he'll know. All these racing drivers know that they know they've never done the perfect lap. They know that there's. You know, there's there's always time on the table, and you know, be thinking, what if I downshifted here, or if I, what if I just placed the car a little bit there? You know, you, you know, he'll be thinking, what could have been? Um, and and at your first home race in a in Formula One, and it's just it's just not quite the start to the year you want, and it's just not quite the start to the weekend that you want, um, and it leaves him everything to do on Sunday. Um, and unfortunately, I think, you know, based on their past luck. You know, if they didn't have any luck, sorry, if they didn't have bad luck, they'd have no luck at all, honestly, uh, the McLarens. So, um, unfortunately, I kind of only see them going backwards. Um, or they're going to have to play a blinder on strategy to even get uh, to the top to the top half of the table. Um, yeah, it, uh, you know, there's a mountain to climb there for uh, for Oscar. Yeah, it's <laughs> it certainly is going to be a very difficult race for McLaren, and I think they are going to be praying that their upgrades come fast and are incredibly effective as soon as they're put on the car. But given it's McLaren, it probably won't be. Um, Aaron, we have Alfa Romeo. They're sitting 17th and 19th. Uh, Joe, ahead of the uh, the new Aussie on the grid, um, Valtteri Bottas. Um, I mean, there's not really a lot you can say about Alfa Romeo. They, they're incredibly inconsistent. They are... You know, sometimes they show glimmers of good pace, sometimes not. And here it was just, I think, as bad as it's really got for Alfa Romeo this season. This was a, a surprise for me to see them both knocked out, especially when one of the top drivers is in the hedge. So it's a Bottas 19th. We, we know Bottas has one lap speed. He was able to, on occasion, match Lewis Hamilton and beat Lewis Hamilton. But he's 0-3 against Joe Guan Yu this season. I think that says a lot more about Joe than it does about Bottas. And, okay, Alpha aren't getting the points that they, they would like because the top eight positions are generally being uh, swallowed up by the top four teams now, which means all these other teams. It's almost a situation like you had in the, the 90s where – the top six places got points and it was Ferrari, McLaren and Williams. And if one of them didn't finish, there was a, a points on, on offer for a Jordan or Benetton or Sauber, which is now Alfa Romeo, of course. So you've got to put yourself in position to do that. And that's what we said about Alpine. You've got to put yourself basically at the front of the queue to capitalise on these opportunities. And Alfa Romeo have done exactly the opposite. They've put themselves pretty much at the very back of it because uh, between their two drivers, I think they've got the lowest combined um, start positions. So coming from 17th and 19th to get anything they're going to have to put on 
a stellar performance and we've mentioned already it's going to be tricky to overtake um maybe a few safety cars and a well-timed pit stop to catapult them up the order we saw that work for Sonoda in Jeddah yeah when you're that far down you've got to throw a bit of a Hail Mary at it haven't you we see that in Formula 2 when drivers qualify down the order they they generally opt for the alternate strategy where they run longer and then put on soft tyres at the end so Maybe they'll take inspiration from Alex Albon and do the the one stop on the final lap, uh, having successfully held everybody up by by that point. But you do have to have the car performance to do it. And based on qualifying, they they don't have it. And Bottas said that was everything from him that he had. And that that's surprising. He only produced an 18.7 compared to a lot of other, which is two tenths slower than Logan Sargent, who had a bit of a messy session and is also a rookie so disappointing day very very disappointing day for Alfa Romeo and their season it looked like it was starting okay with those points for Bottas in Bahrain but it's very quickly gone south yeah it it certainly has and it's a really not a not a good um not a good place for Alfa Alfa Romeo to be um the two drivers that we uh haven't spoken about yet uh Logan Sargent, he had a spin in Q1 um, and never really recovered from it. I think he just um, just didn't get as much out of the car um, as Albon could. And then, of course, Sergio Perez on his first flying lap uh, beached it in the mud, well, the mud and the gravel. Um, so he'll be starting from the back. Uh, that's if the stewards allow him to race. I imagine they will. He did set, I uh, think, a competent lap time in... Um, in free practice. So we'll move straight on um to our predictions. Um Wayne, you've you've already done uh, your predictions for this week on the on the preview show. So has your podium changed at all? Um I've got to say it has too. Uh you know I predicted Verstappen. Uh, luckily I didn't predict Perez. Uh <laughs> I said that I said that he might have gearbox issues. Um which, you know, I don't think he had any gearbox issues. It looked like engine braking with how, how the revs were so high. But uh, you know, initially I went for Verstappen, Alonso and uh and then Stroll. Um I'm not quite sure that Stroll will uh will will get up into the podium, but I can see I can see Alonso getting into the podium very, very easily. Um I'm gonna go I think for uh you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna back the Mercedes, uh, and I'm gonna go with a Russell Hamilton Alonso as 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 my podium. Oh, no Red Bull whatsoever, Aaron. I know you're also a big Mercedes fan. Are you also gonna go that bold and not put a Red Bull on the podium? As Owen was 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 speaking, I was thinking, what what about? The, the Red Bull unreliability returning. That car is not infallible. Both drivers are having a bit of a difficult time. Verstappen is complaining about downshift issues. He, he He's always complained about downshifts or something to the shifts. I think he's just very sensitive to the way that the car changes gears. Or maybe there is just an inherent issue in the way the car is designed that causes it. And he was talking about battery power and obviously the, the drive shaft, potential engine braking issues with Perez. That car is not infallible and they're very fortunate that they've got such a big advantage otherwise they'd be under an awful lot of pressure if Verstappen doesn't finish the race let's assume Verstappen finishes the race wins it he's going to win if if he finishes the race um so if he does finish the race it'd be Verstappen going to go Hamilton second on the on the podium and then uh Fernando Alonso but if he doesn't win it uh, I'm going to go a slightly different podium. I'm going to go Mercedes 1-2 and I'm going to go with uh, Albon third. Uh, we'll get to the bold uh, predictions <laughs> later. Um, for me, my my podium, uh, I'm I'm kind of be that boring one. I'm going to just assume that Max is, is going to win and he's going to absolutely fly off into the distance. Um, so I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to put Max Verstappen first. I'm going to go with my heart as well and put Fernando Alonso in second, and then I'm going to have George Russell um, in third. So, um, Aaron, you've already kind of given your bold prediction, but we'll uh, <laughs> we'll uh, 
we'll move on to a Wayne first and see um, what his bold prediction is going to be for this weekend. Um, right. So uh, I was initially thinking maybe something like Perez not to get points because let's be honest, he's in that he's, he's in that Red Bull, and even if that Red Bull has issues, he'll probably end up in at least tenth. Like that, that's probably going to happen. So I thought, no, I'm going to scratch that one, and instead. You know what? No, I'm still going to go. I'm still going to go. I, I predicted it last week as a bold prediction. I'm going to predict it this week as well. Uh, I think a bold prediction is probably McLaren to get points. It's sad, but true. That that has to be a fact now. Uh, so, Aaron? I'm going to go with Perez not to score points. <laughs> I, I think he's going to... There'll be something that happens. He'll, he'll cause an accident. He'll have a tangle with somebody that completely destroys Verstappen's race. Verstappen's just gone past the pits, gets picked up by the safety car. Everyone else can pit. And Verstappen suddenly is like 12th. And then the, the whole race is turned on its head. That That's the morning I'm looking for tomorrow. I mean, if, if you're going to have drivers in cars that are, and, and top drivers who are in cars that are significantly better than everybody else's, at least make them start from the back and make it fun. So, you know, Lewis Hamilton did this in 2014. He made that title season uh, interesting by constantly having his car catch fire and giving Rosberg a bit of a head start. Um so and he gave Rosberg too much of a head start in 2016. So um, let's at least make it interesting. Let's have some fun. Uh, Perez to not score points and completely turn the race on its head. Okay. Okay. Um, my bold prediction is going to be a lot <laughs> less interesting than, than Aaron's um, sort of Bernie eccleston sort of scheme for a good, exciting racing. Turn um, the sprinklers on. I was going to say, do I hear the sprinklers? <laughs> It's Albert Park. Um, they must have some for the for the grass. <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of go slightly contrary to my um to my podium prediction and say a bold prediction would be both Aston Martins on the podium for tomorrow. I think you know, that could uh, possibly be a uh, a, a possibility. Um, so <laughs> that is that is all from us today. Um, of course, if you are watching the um watching the live stream good morning we are all very tired um but we live stream all of our uh well all of our race reviews and qualifying reviews are recorded live and put out to you um so make sure to subscribe so you always get notified when we go live um we are also available on amazon fire spotify google podcast Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Cast, just so it's the F1 Green Talk podcast. And we have uh, show 270, so you have 269 other shows um, to go listen to if you're stuck with something to listen to just during the afternoon, especially in the UK. Um, you've got the whole day ahead of you. Um, also, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, uh, lights, and better recording equipment for all our hosts. And make sure just... Just subscribe is, is the great thing. Uh, we've seen an explosion in our subscriber numbers and it'd be great to have more of you on board. So um, to our other, uh, to my uh, guests, uh, where can we find more from you? So Aaron, you are from Five Red Lights. Uh, where can they find more from you? At the Five Red Lights is no more. It's been rebranded. Ah. Yes, so it's now AHGP. So don't don't worry. Not the first person to make that, that, uh, that mistake. So... Uh, yeah, it's same place, really. It's similar sorts of videos. So I have an instant reaction or not so instant reaction as it was after Jeddah. Um, so I try and go live for about 20, 25 minutes after each race. Uh, so I'll be going live tomorrow. I do driver ratings uh, videos and I'm trying. It's very difficult now. I've, I've got a new job where full time journalist. So it takes up most of my time. So video making is few and far between, but I'm going to try and do some more. Um, you can find me on Twitter, AHGP Pod, on Instagram, AHGP or Aaron Harper Grand Prix, AH Grand Prix, something of that ilk. Um, yeah, and uh, my personal Twitter is Aaron Harper 41. So, yeah, all that good stuff. Lots of shorts, lots of fun. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Brilliant, Aaron. Make sure to check it out. And away, you are a co host of this podcast. Um, but where can people find more from you? Um... 
you know, you'll have to go to my Twitter that I don't use. And yeah, that's it. It's at Owen, at Owen Medford. Uh, I retweet things every so often. Um, that's about it. But you can sit, find me here if you want my opinions. Uh, yeah, if you want to find more from me, I am uh, just one of the co-hosts on here, um, and I will occasionally appear as a guest where I will actually give some of my um, my more honest re- <laughs> opinions on the world of F1. But we will be back uh, tomorrow, 9am British Summer Time, um, for the race review. But until then, thank you so much for, for listening to the Crit Talk presented by Bet Online. Stay safe and goodbye.